All right. Welcome, everybody, to the weekly Probate Mastery Group coaching call. If you weren't here last week, my beautiful backdrop is because I'm on a riverbank in West Virginia where there's one cell tower. If anyone comes up, like high school friends comes up and starts talking, please excuse that because it is a small town. And hopefully we don't have any surprise thunderstorms or anything like that. So I prefer this as an office if I can. Anyone who has anything, any way we can help you, any struggles you're having, any successes you would like to share, the floor is open. How can we serve you? Chad, I feel like I'm, first of all, hello. I'm glad you hey, cleared hey. the real background. I was going to ask again. I feel like I'm chasing my schedule and uh, it's quite annoying. I had a conversation with, so I don't have you, I don't know if you've met Grant Cox yet. Grant is a dear friend of mine and I mentored him into this space. He's also working for Magnum Opus Project. You two need to know each other. And I challenged him this morning to connect with you. You're very similar in the level of self-accountability is impressive as hell in both of you guys. You're, you have very high standards. You've also, so he also bit off more than he could chew. He bought Chris Prefontaine's course and he jumped into that and he started, he's doing all kinds of stuff. So he's had the time management struggle and we've talked about it over the last several months. And unfortunately, Grant has had some loss in the family and hasn't been able to make it to these calls, but. I really want you to connect with Grant because he is in his first year of production. He's just getting in the brokerage. So Grant's a professional chef. He's where he's worked in James Beard award-winning restaurants. So standard of operations and standard of service is very high for him. And I see the same in you. And to be frank, like he is in the trenches fighting the fight right now. I can tell you how I manage my time, but my day-to-day -day is different than yours right now. And I think Grant might be one of the best resources in this community for you. So not to brush off your question at all, okay. we can talk about it all you want, but I really, if you could just make a commitment to connect with him this week, I think mean, you guys will, I'm betting five years from now, we'll, we'll remember this conversation. Sounds good. Who's got, who wants to share what's working? Josh Foster. I haven't seen you in a while. Welcome. Thank you, man. Good to be back. Rocking that exit. I'm glad to be back. Rocking those exit realty colors. Yeah. So Steve Moore is actually, she's, Christine's way too modest to tell anybody, but she gave her an ex, like the Exit Realty Mini Cooper S, like that, the teal. So she's rocking the Exit Realty convertible now. Awesome. All right. Anybody else? Anything we need to cover? Rich Ransom, welcome back. There's a name from the, from the early days. All right, then I will just uh, put some food for thought out there. If you guys haven't already, go look at the recently released NAR market report. It's the survey of home buyers and home sellers, as well as the industry report. And there's a few things that are glaringly obvious to me, but on, on these calls, we tend to talk about things in, in the terms of six or seven digits of gross commission. And it made me realize just how rewarding this work is. Like the, I used to go through that and like use that as my target, like the, to set the bar for myself. The average realtor makes it had gone upwards of 48,000. Now it's back down to 43,000. And the, the average had gone from nine sides a year to 12, and now it's back down to 10. And I guess I kind of take for granted the quality of this community and the quality of the conversations we have and, and the amount of income we're able to earn in this tight little niche of the market, which represents a fraction of overall niches that you could work. But it's really interesting to see the struggle everybody else is going through. And it comes through in the numbers, like it's rolling up the numbers from 1.4 million realtors. 73% of which, or roughly a million, are in residential. And in the first two years, people's average income, or the median income, sorry, not the average, the median is 10,000 bucks. And the, for those of you that are just getting started, I think if you're on this call, you're probably killing that average or that median. But uh, if you haven't, go look at that report. I'm going to, I'll give you my kind of the things that are really obvious to me, but there's, I, I see opportunity in that, right? So we've got an industry that replaces itself statistically about every third or fourth year. These people are the ones that are coming in, trying things, muddying the water for us. And you see how little money they're making. And it's easy to see when you look at that, it, you don't have a lot of competition when you hold yourself to, to a standard like you guys are. And that's why we're having those six digit and seven digit conversations. And the people on this call are able to, to post those kind of numbers and not to mention the margin. Like this is one of the, the, the best 
best niches as far as profit margin, because you can get one set of leads that will produce for 12 to 18 months, really 12 to 24. I've had them 24, 25 months out. So your expense ratio is, is way lower in this space too. But something interesting that I, I looked at this morning and I'll do a post on this afternoon, but take a look and see what, what stands out to you. To me, it's motivating for different reasons now than it used to be. Cause I'm like, hell yes, my group is 10 times the median. So if you haven't seen that, there's a summary report and then there's the full report, which is 150 bucks. I think the summary is, is probably enough for most, unless you're really analytical. Has anybody else reviewed that? What are we covering today, guys? Yeah, so Kat reminded everybody in the chat. So Kevin Ward just kind of, we did an improv on Friday. Several of you were there, but uh, if you guys haven't watched that, Kevin's a, a really good coach that He's, I've been watching him since 2012. We came into the residential space around the same time. It, it's interesting, like the, the people that I used to listen to on podcasts and watch on YouTube, now I get to collaborate with them. That's a cool feeling. So Kevin was nice enough to give us a half an hour of his time, thanks to David Pinnell. And we had a conversation and he and I had never, we didn't get a chance to talk before the fact. So and it was, it's authentic. And it's really interesting to see that a coach that's been doing general real estate coaching and hammered outbound prospecting for listing has done a few probate deals on his own. He's kind of in the same position as a lot of you guys. You get one inbound referral, then another, then you kind of wake up and go, wait a minute, maybe this is what I can do as a specialty. But we had a, a just a candid conversation about how he thinks probate should be worked. And luckily, everything that he thought as a very seasoned and, and successful and respected real estate coach, everything he said was consistent with what we teach in mastery and the, the conversations we have here. And we just, we kind of, Dave and I stayed on the line and did a little kind of bonus coaching call after the fact. So if you get a chance, watch that. Kat has already posted it in the Facebook group and, and on the blog. Chad, I got something. I have two different topics and it's not, since you brought up a few calls ago, just kind of going over a broad list of items, whether it's probate, wealth growth and all that stuff. I, I remember you briefly talking about, given that I'm in California, about how it's maybe a better idea to figure out a way to be a resident in another state or something along those lines in order to minimize the taxation. I guess maybe my overthinking self with, from a tax point of view, and I understand you're not a tax attorney, so I'm just, it's just more of a, an opinion. Wouldn't, fr from a tax point of view, couldn't the state of any state that you're in, given that they want you to pay the tax, couldn't they subpoena your, your phone records and just say, Hey, well, Chad, I understand that you're showing you're a Florida resident and that's why you're paying X amount, blah, blah, blah. But our phone records show that a, your kids go to school in Los Angeles and B your phone records show me that almost all your conversations come from Los Angeles. I don't know if I'm overthinking it, but I'm, I guess I'm just trying to create all types of shields possible, that type of a uh, situation. So everybody's situation is different. Mine, I'm 39 single and I built my entire life around being nimble. So being able to pick up and go where I want, when I want, with whom I want. Yeah. And that's why it's easier for me. I have, I can live more fluidly than most people. I started making those decisions around 18 years old because I just had this feeling I never wanted to grow up because when I looked, it looked like a fucking trap, to be honest. <laughs> and so I just, I, I literally made all of my decisions in that way. So it finally came time to where my income, just, you know, it kept rising and I'm like, wow, uh, this is an option for me. It's legitimate. I have passed my structure through, to, I just had this conversation this morning with a very high profile wealth planning tax consultant. He lives in Puerto Rico. He's taking advantage of title 21 and title 22. And we'll get to that in a second. But before I had these people in my network, I met with Florida CPAs, Virginia CPAs, Florida tax attorneys, Virginia tax attorneys, DMV, police officers, insurance brokers. And I tried to pass it. I tried to, I'm like, please shoot holes in this. I don't want to go do this, incur the expense. And I hate administrative things like that. Everyone's, nobody can show me a hard and fast definition of residency in the state of Florida, or everyone thinks you have to be in a, a state for 180 days. I can't find it in writing anywhere. Neither can the professionals that were helping me. We can find assumptive like blog posts and, and RV forums where people are saying it, but they can't ever source the information. So for me, 
what I'm doing is legitimate. And I spent from, I spent the whole winter in Florida this year. All of my companies are Florida companies, but it might not work for everybody. The school thing is one of those. Now I have friends who have residency in Florida that live in, that have second homes in other places. They homeschool their children. And typically, if you're optimizing life at that level, it's probably for more reasons than to just save a little bit on taxes. It's to, to free yourself up where you can become more nimble and travel and, and have your kids experience something other than an antiquated education system. So a lot of the friends that I have that have residency in, in other states that have multiple homes, they will homeschool their children. They have PPO healthcare plans. So you can go to the, like with my healthcare plan, I, go, I can go to the doctor anywhere in the world, submit it, and they reimburse me. And that was another careful decision. Like I had to go dig in and research because right? I hate insurance. I just, I, luckily I've only been to the doctor once in a decade, but so I don't have to use it much. But if I do, if I wreck a motorcycle or a mountain bike, so I had to make sure I picked the right thing. So even down to my healthcare plan, it was chosen where I could be, I can go in Florida and be fine, or I can go when I'm out in California. So it's not going to work for everybody. And that's one of the reasons I don't, you know, like my story is very specific to me, obviously. However, there are some little things you can do. Now, if you really, so I've gotten my effective tax rate from a top 1% bracket. I've gotten, and this is fully above board. I have a conservative accountant, but I've gotten that down to 19.3%. And the guy that was on the phone with me earlier today is like, how the hell did you do this on your own? I'm like, I don't know. Um, like I just took advantage of everything that I could without creating red flags and nobody wants to be audited. I'm not worried about it because I'm not, I haven't done anything wrong, but you still don't want to go through that. It's just, you don't want a root canal. So you can look at those income tax free states, maybe some of those closer to you, like Washington. If you have a place you like to travel, grab a second home in those markets and it gives a little more legitimacy to it. But in order for them to come looking, I have a home in Virginia and I spent most of 2020 there because everything was locked down. Traveling wasn't a whole lot of fun. And I decided to, that Virginia was a better place to hang out than Florida. So Virginia, if they were to, to say, this guy used to, in order to have a problem with it, Virginia would have to go, this guy's paying us DMV taxes, personal property taxes, but what about his income tax? So then they have to go contact the state of Florida and like they have to reconcile records and contact the IRS. And right now there's no no system in place for that. Now, one of the things that the current political climate has on the table is they're really trying to come after anyone and everyone that makes money. Whether you're doing anything wrong or not, you're basically the default accusation is you're guilty of tax evasion. And we're going to, we're going to try to squeeze blood out of every turnip we can find because they printed so much money. And so the climate could change. With Puerto Rico is the safest place that you can do this because it's done under Title 21 and 22. And I think that's switching to 5960, uh, a different law. But in that, that's you have to spend, I think it's 183 days that you need to be proven in the state of Puerto Rico. There's other requirements. You need to create some jobs. You have to establish an office space. It's not that hard. I have, gosh, at this point, probably close to 20 friends who have actually, who are taking advantage of this, that are spending at least six months a year down there. Very affordable. Seems to be a pretty good place to invest in real estate. Everybody always says, oh, there's hurricanes, the hurricane, this and that. I'm like, have you been to Florida? But that's one you could look into that is, that, that's life-changing savings there. So you pay zero uh, percent the capital gain, I think it's 0% capital gains and 4% total income tax, federal and state is a combined 4%. So you may look in, into the title 21 and 22. Yeah, somebody said the EXP agent. So like Tim and Julie Harris are with EXP, the Tim and, Ju uh, Tim and Julie coaching. So they live in Dorado. Peter Schiff, like the, the contrarian gold bug, he lives in their neighborhood. So there's, if you look at the, and I'm blanking on his name, one of the, you're, you're all the EXP superstars. He's in my mastermind and I'm forgetting his name. AJ Mita. AJ is a big proponent of Title 20 and 22. He's lived down there for a while. He was, he lived in an RV like me and then ended up in Puerto Rico. So maybe that's my next chapter. I don't know, but be careful for sure. But there are ways that there's just like with most everything else, 90% of the advice you get is applicable to the average person. But there's always professionals out there that, that kind of serve that top 10%. And I just kind of issue myself a challenge, to, whether it's in riding motorcycles. I just, I 
was I said earlier. So I taught, I teach people to ride big adventure motorcycles. And the way I went from a new rider to a professional trainer in under three years, and I'm six foot seven, I'm not made for that. But I always looked for the top 10% in any crowd. I'm like, who's the best rider here? And I was right behind him in the morning. We took off and I get my ass handed to me every time I went out. It's no different with like tax specialists or financial advisors or real estate agents or anything. So be careful whose advice you're taking. If they're not further along than you are by a multiple of probably three, to be fair, then keep looking. And I've looked since late 2016 is when I started to restructure everything. And today I finally found the tax consultant that I intend to hire. And it's been that long, that many conversations. There are people who they're discreet about it, but there are people out there that can help guide you through some of these decisions who have already done it. I'm sure there are California residents that, that do this as an advisor for people who like their California lifestyle, but don't like the direction that, that the politicians have taken the state and it's only getting worse. And there's a lot of people who are running from it. But very long answer, I guess in summary, be careful if you're going to remain as putting a load on the California state government, like healthcare and, and school and things like that. If you're not putting a load on them and you're paying, you're paying your fair share of federal taxes, it would require them to reconcile records with everywhere, you know, wherever you're, you are consuming or spending your time. And it's unlikely if you're not breaking the law. Thank Keep you. Keep looking, man. There's, there's a book that a lot of people have been talking about. Oh, man, I haven't read it yet. It's, the author's a couple of degrees from me. It's about global citizenship, about getting passports in other countries. And that's something that I, I know several people who hold more than one passport. And part of that reason is sometimes taxation. So you could even take it to that level. Nomad Capitalist is the name of the book. And I have not read it yet, so I'm not giving it a full endorsement. But some guys that I really know and trust have really said, you got to read this. So the, I think it's The Nomad Capitalist is, is the name of the book. And that may give you some ideas on how to kind of optimize your own situation. Cool. Chad, this is Martha Matthews Vasquez. Full disclosure, I'm a former enrolled agent, which means I was took an exam to practice tax prep before the IRS. And I did that with the state and trust tax law for about 20 years. So I've seen all variances in what happens after you die, not only while you're living. The first thing that I look at is how do you want to live? And if you want to live dictated by taxes, it doesn't matter where you live. You pick where the taxes are cheapest. If you're in a good state that handles the taxes, hopefully you're getting what you're paying for. If you're not, then yeah, it's time to move. But it is hard for people with, that are big earners, but you've got lots of options out there. And there are lots that of ways. That was way, way more benign than I thought. You set that up. I'm like, oh, hell, she's about to blow my mind. And I'm, I got to go, guys. Call my <laughs> CPA. So that's well, something like, hey, you missed something. No, you haven't missed anything. You got it pretty so, where do you choose residency? Well, I'm a fifth generation Floridian. I'm still, in, I've moved back to Florida from Ohio. Okay. Yeah. I've lived in Tennessee, then Ohio, and I finally was able to get back to Florida. And I love it. Ten yeah, Tennessee is a great state that most overlook. Everybody's like flooding into Austin and into uh, Texas. East Tennessee. East Tennessee. Fed, you need to move to Knoxville, buddy. I lived in Oak Ridge. That's better than Knoxville. Huh? Yeah. The home of the Manhattan Project. There's a lot of history oh, now. You got it. A lot of nice ponds I, over there with uh, radiation symbols on them. Which yeah, <laughs> I learned to scuba dive in a quarry that's right by ORNL. And I'm like, oh, I wonder why it's so blue. It was like electric blue water. And I'm like, I hope it's the limestone. <laughs> it was probably not the limestone. Before that, I was only 5'6". Now I'm 6'7". Yeah, thank you, Martha. Does anybody else here live like kind of a nomadic lifestyle? Does anyone want to share kind of how they structured? All right. There's lots of, I've, I don't know, I guess I started being an unconventional kid at, at a young age. And I've always, I've never just taken stuff at face value. Just because you live here, you have to do this way because everybody else does. And I've always, I've looked and just curiously been turning over stones. And that's kind of resulted in really the accelerated wealth creation for me. So I, I've got to figure out how to teach that where it applies to the, the general group without getting people in trouble. What I'm considering is bringing some of these professionals in, like the person that took me, and I, I had you guys, I asked you guys to read the book, Who Not How, and he's, the, he's a who that I've been looking for years. 
and I finally found them. So I want, I'm trying to decide if I share those people with you, like if we let them do portions of the course and we put this together or it's kind of modular and you pick and choose the pieces that might apply to your situation. But that's, that's kind of the, the direction I'm heading. Asset uh, wealth creation, then asset protection, and kind of those five things we talked about. But so we'll, we'll have some more conversation on this. But okay. Miriam Cruz, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. It's my first time, so I'm excited. Yeah, you just signed up today or last night, right? I just saw your name coming through. Like this morning, yeah, like right you, on time. I, you finished, right? Like you passed all the tests and finished the course? So I've actually took half of the course in the past, and I'm actually a certified probate specialist here in California through the Department of realtors or whatever that's called. I'm still learning the, the lingo, but I was able to join you today. And I think it was like meant to be because I got my first listing on my first appointment, which is really cool. And I was so excited. I've been working as an assistant to a real estate agent, making cold calls and doing things like that for about five years. So I'm finally an agent and I'm doing it on my own. So I'm super excited to be here, but what's happening now with my person who was very excited to list his property with me is he's having like emotional stuff come up so he's delaying the the process now so mm -hmm. i don't really know how to go about that because i know it's very emotional and i think i'm perfect for this field because of that because i understand and i'm very into the human side Pat. but now it and now he's not answering my calls so is the contract is the listing agreement signed yes and what do you need to talk to him about today about him moving so that's the challenge is getting the property ready to show Exactly. He's making so many excuses and now he just Give stopped. Me. He doesn't know first the storage where he's going to place his belongings. He thought they had bed bugs. Then he feels like it's too rushed. Doesn't feel like he has enough time. His mom's taxes. His mom is the, the, the decedent. Like every time that I talk to him is something new where he's not actually making any progress. Like he's not moving. At all. What's like, your, what is so the MLS upload date? Like what's your active listing date? My active listing date was two weeks ago. I'm sorry. It's not even on the MLS yet. Right. So I just signed the contract two weeks ago. Yeah. Right. But in, don't you get penalized if you have a listing that you don't upload in X amount of time of the active listing date? Not unless you have a, I, not unless you have a sell. If you're in California, if you have a sell, which is seller exclusion to list property on the MLS, if you have that with a specific date, there's four options on that form. You either have uh, don't mark it for the entirety of the listing agreement or don't mark it for X amount of days or it, it's called a SELM. The abbreviation on car, car forms is SELM. If you look it up, uh, that way you won't get penalized. That's what I figured. Miriam, I'm assuming you did not do that, right? No. But here's, where I'm, here's where I'm going with this. You're breaking yes. MLS rules. And if you look, you probably are, the fine is probably like $250 a day. Is that what it is, Fed, with car? I'm not sure, but the thing, if she never input it, input the, the listing onto the MLS, I think she's okay. As long as you have an MOT, the modification of terms, and then you get that signed from your broker. But if you did input it into the MLS as for example, going live on X date, then there is a penalty. I'm not sure what the penalty is though. So where I was going with that is if you could get an angle. So He's in what we call probate quicksand, and it's very common. And that's why you hear me talk about leadership rather than salesmanship, because a lot of times we have to use the trust and rapport that we build with them to get them out of their own damn way. And I've had to do this on at least half of the trans the probate transactions that I've done. And that's why I work so damn hard on the front end to make sure that I understand who the decision makers are, what their motivations are, what their, their, their pain points are. Because at some point, I probably will end up coming back and reminding them of that. So things like, I want to find out what their next move is, how they intend to invest the distribution from the inheritance. Because that gives me empath like empathetic ammunition. So when I go back, I could say, listen, Doug, when we first met, what did you tell me you wanted more than anything? You wanted to get a high price for your mother's home so you could go live closer to your son who's in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and give his kids a higher quality of life because their dad's away on deployment. You want to be there for him, whatever it is. I'm pulling the story out of the air. But mm -hmm. I find those, you said he's very emotional. So you need emotional ammunition 
to throw him a rope so you can pull him out of that 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 probate quicksand so get personal stories from him and get Mm -hmm. to the root the like typically this behavior is coming from fear and that fear in this case he's already initiated probate he's already made he's made the hard mental commitment of putting the home on the market but now he's pulling back his ego is screaming dude everything's going to change everything life is not going to be the same like you got to stay here this is where we're safe this is where we've always been and that's controlling him that fear is resulting in he's bullshitting you that he doesn't really think that there's bed bugs he doesn't really need four months to move we all know if you're if i gave you a two million dollar house and said you got to be moved in by tomorrow how many people wouldn't be moved into that damn house you would find a way right like you would buy lots of beer and pizza mm-hmm. and have all your friends over there to get it done. So the, they're, they're, they're false objections because he, his ego won't allow him to say, Miriam, I love my mom more than anything in the world. And I am scared to death as a man to progress through life without her because it's fucking paralyzing me. He'll never say that. So you have to tactfully get him to that realization that he's okay and that he can okay. move forward. And the best way to do that is to get, like when you'll hear me in session three, which you may not have gotten to right yet, but when I do the home tour, I get them to tell me personal stories about the family. And I try to get the humorous ones. I'm like, this is such a cool, great room. Tell me about the Christmas tree your mom used to put in here and get them to start. So they start to identify with me as a friend, more even more than a trusted advisor. They're sharing family stories with me. This is one of the reasons I do this, because when it comes down to that hard discussion where I have to say, Doug, listen, you you trust me, right? You've shared a lot of personal things with me, and you know that my my sole intent here is to help you and your family minimize the stress and maximize the equity. Like, you you believe that, right? So can I tell you what you need to hear? It's probably not what you want to hear. Here's what I think. I think that this is such a drastic change that you're not ready to move forward. And I think there's two options here. We can find a way to make you comfortable in doing this. And I will 100% have your back and support you. Or we can take this home in the market, off the market. We can forget this for now. But I just want you to understand, it's not going to change the fact that, that you told me just weeks ago, you wanted A and you're choosing to stick with B. So it is, are you really being true to yourself? And is that really what you want? Or do you, would you rather me help you find a way forward? And whatever that conversation might be, end it with absolute silence on an emotional question. Would you, do you want me to help you move forward in life and move past this? And it, it's hard without being, having the full context, like knowing what all of your conversations have been. But I would suggest that you find a way to get face to face with him and give yourself an hour, like just to be safe. You might only need a few minutes, but what did you notice when you were at the property? What kind of person is he? What could you do that would be like kind of a a shocking gesture for him? So he's very emotional. And actually the reason why he said yes to me was he had been looking at my coaching. I do women empowerment coaching. Mm -hmm. So he said, once he saw my YouTube videos, like he knew he could trust me. So he said, before you got here, I knew I wanted to work with you. And I think you, that he is holding on to that. Go ahead. Sorry, I was thinking out loud. Gonna, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was going to ask, do you, have a, do you have a good relationship with an exterminator that you've used a lot, kind of have some social capital with? No, not in a relationship, but I did reach out to someone to set up the appointment to go visit the storage that he was concerned about, but they needed consent from the people. So I made it, I set it up for him, but he had to call and he hasn't called and now it's been weeks. So has I'm he doing already, things- Has he already rented the, the unit? The unit's been there, yeah. So he's paying bought, for it. He's paying for it and I bought him boxes so he could move his stuff and still, he's still packing. So everything is like very delayed. And when I go over there, it's very emotional where he wants to talk to me about my coaching. And I'm like, how do I get him from the emotional? He even found a hawk and he texted me about him. What should we name him? It feels like he's like very emotional tied to me, but he's not making progress on the real estate side, which is stressing me out. Cause I'm like, dude, this is what we were supposed to do together. Miriam, like first, I want to say how impressed I am that you thought outside of the box to call an exterminator and coordinate that, even though it didn't work out because that's exactly where I was going. So bravo to you. Like that's thinking outside of the box to serve your clients. 
it does not everything works right sometimes we have to try a few things i want you to think about your coaching experience and i want you to think of a female who has gone through something similar had created a mental barrier for herself and you can take responsibility for being the one that kind of said what you said that motivated her to break herself through that do you have one of those stories yes okay so he chose you because he respects that you, have you heard me talk about feel felt found yes i want you to go back to that story from that lady that you helped break through or have her own emotional breakthrough and i want you to turn that into a feel felt found story specifically for him and i want you to say doug i've been thinking about what you said when you hired me and the situation that you and i have found ourselves in this is a new relationship and i i appreciate the trust you've given me i want to tell you a story about a girl named Terry that I worked with a couple of years ago and go into it and say she was she came up to this point she knew what she wanted she knew how to get it but she was doing this and she felt like there was just so many obstacles in the way but what she found was that through just having my support and just having someone to talk it through with and moving forward one foot at a time just one step at a time she was able to accomplish her wildest dreams what whatever breakthrough she had she was able to do that in a fraction of the amount of time she thought and it was because her emotional state had such a drain on her energy that she just couldn't do it she needed help and when you hired me is that not what you hired me for to help you so i'm going to ask you everything we've done up to now is to help you reach the goal you told me you wanted to reach 2 weeks ago from where i sit Doug it feels like you've moved the goal post on me so i am potentially breaking rules that could cost me tens of thousands of dollars i've been trying to respect like the boundary that you've put into place but now it's time that we have this conversation are you ready for me to help you or not but i think because he respects you for the coaching i think that my yeah him identify with somebody else make a hero to the story get him to identify with with that person and then translate it into his situation and ask him to take an action immediately no matter how small get an action what are you committed to do right now and you can soften that up obviously but do not leave there without a commitment from him to do something even if you have to start with something small can you please clean this damn place up before my photographer gets here on monday or whatever that is and if you if if you continue to if he continues this call me back with more information get more personal information like mm-hmm. what motivates him what he wants to do what he would do if he won a million dollars or what he plans to do with the inheritance or what are his values and these are things that i don't even go as i'm not really specific in teaching this but i'm always looking at what are, what is this person's values because that's what motivates their emotions and those emotions produce their behavior and if i know what motivates them or demotivates them then i i know how i can influence them and uh, i would say not manipulate them uh, i think there's a difference if you're getting a, if the other person is getting a positive result and serves them i think that's influence the yeah. opposite of that is 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 manipulation so it may seem like we're psychoanalyzing this guy to get him to do something for, to get a real estate deal closed but i don't think that's really not the spirit of this i think you legitimately want to do what you promised right i do and even when i see him like he gave me this book to read every time we see each other he's excited to talk about the emotional part yoga and different things i'm like oh my goodness <laughs> everything but the real estate so i think Honestly, I feel like he's found an attachment with me now. And it's okay, I'm trying to help you start your best life. I know it's hard without his mother. He's been with her for 30 years. He's not married. And I know it's scary. But I think what you helped me come up with is having a real raw <clears throat> conversation with him about this next step. So that's what I'm going to do. So, oh, just to recap, there's a couple of logic bullets that I want you to have in the magazine. One, my broker is going to have my assets if we don't get if we don't do something here like the logic of there are black and white rules unless we sign x y or z addendum to eliminate to overcome those rules i have to get this uploaded in mls otherwise i'm going to be the one losing money the second logical point is right now you're the one losing money every day and figure out how much are the property taxes estimate insurance utilities all that like look at what the true holding cost of the asset are 
and have that ready. So this is probably a pure emotional conversation. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem like he's really hung up on the logic. He's using the logic as excuses, right? The logistics of that place has bed bugs. I can't possibly move my stuff in there, or there's just not enough time or this, but you, and you called it from the very beginning. It's obvious, you know, this, but I would still have some of those logical points of your mm -hmm. own because he's got his right. But yours have legitimacy. Like mm -hmm. you can say, here's the CAR rule and this is going to cost me money. And, and we've already stepped out of bell or this is how much money it takes you every day. I find that's really impactful. That's what encouraged me to, I, I can't have debt. I hate debt because my brain works it down to a daily dollar figure. So when I look at the interest rate on a loan, I'm like, okay, so that's on, on an annual basis, divided by 52, that comes down to the week, divided by, so holy shit, $38 a day for a pickup? No way. And I just pay it, I just pay for it. And it's a trick I learned from Marriott Timeshare Salesman. I don't know, has anybody else ever gone on Timeshare pitches just as a hobby? I think it's fun as hell. They, they do offer really good sales training and it's really interesting to see the tactics they use. So I actually took that from Marriott Timeshare Salesman. They take a big, ridiculous, terrible investment and they break it down to a daily cost. Chad, this is $3 a day. Do you drink Starbucks? And I'm like, but it's, you can kind of use the same thing in reverse and tell him, to listen, Doug, since we started this, it's been 14 days. Do you know how much money you've spent in the last 14 days when we could have been maximizing the equity in this home? And it's probably to the tune of you know, in, in the thousands, not in the hundreds. Okay. So a little bit of emotion, a little bit of logic on backup in case you need it. And the biggest thing is give him an action item that he can do for you. And man, there's just so much coming up. Some of the, the mad three magic words that I learned that will create bonds very quickly. Can you help me? Well, that's cool. But can you help me? Mm -hmm. And try to, there's powerful psychology behind it. But you can say, Doug, I, I know you, you've been a little hard to reach. So I came over. Here's a gift. Take him whatever. If, if you've talked about any food he might like or anything like that. Really also, I commend you too on you thought outside of the, the box and you took him boxes. And that was awesome. That's a really thoughtful gift that he actually needs. You didn't show up with an edible arrangement. Diabetes. So it was something that he could use. So think about maybe something you could take him, something that you really appreciate. You think he might like a yoga teacher. <laughs> hey, Doug, I brought you something. I would, I think face to face, like where he can't run from you and he has to look you in the eye because he obviously respects you and then ask him for that commitment and say, Doug, can you do this for me by this time? And even if it's just small to get him moving in that direction. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sorry for all the time I took. No worries. I, I got long winded. The other thing, Miriam, I want you to, to pay attention to in session three is how I use target date as an anchor. So you don't find yourself in this situation again. I okay. talk about it where it's right after the objection role play. And after I do the home tour, as soon as I go back into the kitchen and kind of open the folder and start having the business conversation, I set the anchor. And that anchor is target date. So I've gathered all this emotional information, all this logical information. I'm going to anchor it on something that if they ever are standing in their way, I can come back to that anchor and be like, hey, you remember when we sat in the kitchen, we stood in the kitchen and you told me that if you could wave a magic, if you could wave this blue pen and have everything your way, this would be done on this date. You remember that conversation? So tell me what's mm -hmm. changed because have I done everything I said I would do? Okay. And you've moved the goalpost on me. So how am I supposed to, to live up to the commitment that I made to you if, the, if you're changing the rules on me? Like we're a team here, right? Remember I said we're working together. I don't work for you. So help me understand what the hell is going on because you're risking my reputation and my money for X reasons here. And I can have a stern conversation because I proactively set that anchor, got them to tell me what they expect from me as the person who will lead them through this. Then when they start dragging their feet, it's time for me to hold them accountable. And that has worked incredibly well for me. So I want you, it's probably too late in this scenario, but yeah. I think this is a, a good teachable moment for everybody. Listen to that, what, like how I use the target date as an anchor and toward the end of session three, where it's in the face-to-face -face appointment. And this is the reason why I learned to do that on, on consistently on every deal because so many people start moving backwards.
and it embarrasses the hell out of them when you put it that way. Listen, I've lived up to my side of the deal. What's your story? And there, that usually is what you get is an, an, a profuse apology followed by swift action because they now feel that, I don't know, it seems to me like, I know for me, the most negative emotion I have is disappointing another human. I, I hate it. And most people are like that, I think. And that's kind of what you're using against them. If you show them that they've disappointed you and they will move damn mountains to catch back up to the target date. Got it. Thank you. It's a common one. It's more common with females who lose their mothers. But you found, I'll bet you, if you look closely, he probably had a really close relationship with his mother. And if you want to really dig into the psychology of that, really psychoanalyze him, go study the Oedipus complex. Got it. Chad, I guess she could, one of the ways that Miriam could also just kind of get him to talk and just kind of prep to set that anchor, she could also just, you said to use words that were, I think, emotional words. So she could say something along the lines, it sounds like you're really overwhelmed. And then from there, all of a sudden, he's just going to just throw up all the all the feelings and all that stuff so it gives her i don't want to call it ammunition but essentially it allows her to break each component down either in groups or one at a time i yeah i don't know i found that to help a lot when when they beat around the bush then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you just you just talk you just yeah i always go with the you sound like you're really overwhelmed or this sounds really stressful and then they say yeah it's stressful because this that i'm overwhelmed it, i am overwhelmed because my mom used to do this and i don't know what to do about this that and then all of a sudden she can have her team of specialists so for example it could even come down to i don't know what to do about taxes or i don't know what to do with the money once i don't know what ha what this is going to cost me this and that and then all of a sudden she may have a financial advisor or whomever that can say, oh, you know what? Uh, Miriam could say, I have Chad Corbett who can talk to you about this, that I can have him call you today. Or actually he's going to call you today. I'm going to set that up. And then you spoke about this in the past. When I read the, that one sentence is what sold me on Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference. That's when I was like, yes, that's what the summary I've been trying to teach people forever. And it, it seems like you... Are, are really not comfortable moving forward, Doug. But two weeks ago, we kind of laid out a plan. So tell me what's going on. And it's, you're not being accusatory. It's indirectly, you're being indirectly accusatory, but they tend to just, just open up. When people call and they're really red hot under the collar, it seems like you may have misunderstood why I sent that. The whole story rolls out. I agree because that combined with, if you had a magic wand, what would you do? all of a sudden it just turns into you're calling them out without sounding like you're accusing them mixed with if you had it your way what would you do and then all of a sudden they they essentially give you the recipe of how to have you miriam have you read never split the difference no but i have it on my notes yeah, yeah. so skip to the part like well, the part you're looking for is on, on tactical empathy miriam if you're looking at never split the difference if you have audible it's amazing on audible you feel like you're it is. into a movie it's unbelievable yeah. Thank you. i always appreciate yeah. books better when the author self narrates yeah the other one of the other ones i recommend is uh, the e-myth revisited michael gerber has that george carlin voice like that that one's good to listen to thank you all right next up is mike with that yes yeah. Yes, hi everybody. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned mentioned team. I'm actually with Liberta EXP group. So basically, I got uh, certified with you last year, and I just moved over to EXP this year. I'm trying to check out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'm going to start door knocking and using the EXP Express offers a platform to get more mail outs, door knocking postcards, but also trying to see if there is any type of campaign, email campaign that I could implement to my KV core. So instead, you know, just besides calling, door knocking, sending letters, I could use some kind of email campaign that you would recommend because some of these leads, they have emails and I would like to take advantage of that uh, feature that EXP allows me to use, which is KV core to implement that email uh, campaigns. Any, any feedback on that? I wish I could say, here it is. So I have pretty high standards for email marketing because most people do it very poorly. We were working on, last week we talked about, a, it was originally laid out as a 10 week campaign. We've actually stretched it out to where each series of it runs two weeks. Part of that is email and that email 
like the email subject is relative to the YouTube video that we made that is also a blog post and also a Facebook ad. That is kind of an all-inclusive multimedia. I don't know if it's going to be a product or if I just hand it to you guys, but that's, I like to proof things out. And I know done is better than perfect, but I at least want to see a result. I want to be able to hand you something and say, listen, if we did this and here's the result we got. And all the letters that all the leads send, those were tested with my dollars. So we're testing stuff like that right now. I don't have anything that I can plug you into today as far as, as I can say, this is a good result. What some people have done is basically just taken the main points out of the, the probate letters and turn each bullet point into an email. And okay. folks that have had success with that, are you comfortable copywriting or do you feel like you're a pretty good writer? No, I highly doubt it. I have a second passport. I'm from Poland, so that yeah. helps. But my English probably is not there, you know, to be able well, to. Well, just write it in Polish. So I don't know if, if you've ever used Fiverr or Upwork, but you can find some pretty talented copywriters. They're not all equal. Make sure you see some of their work. Make sure they have experience doing email copywriting. The, the bigger, I'll, I'll give you my secrets of email is less is more. Your subject line should always be a question that hope ideally an emotional question that has something to do with either their the pain that they're in or the result that they want to achieve and use one emoji either before the subject line or after the subject line put in an emoji ideally you want to have small paragraphs start a new paragraph even when you think it's too much like it's too soon if it's a two sentence paragraph still anytime you get anywhere close to shifting the subject go to a new paragraph, always put a call to action in there and always put a PS line. The less words is more, have a specific intent. Like when you or whomever write the email, say this email should be number three and the call to action, what I want them to do when they finish reading is X and write it to that. I've been building email lists and email marketing since 2011. My overall open rate, like on the all the leads master list was 53% with a click-through rate of about 18%, which is, yeah, it's really know, good. I don't know why, like it's unreal, but that's, those are all the tactics I use. Those are, that I just told the world my secrets. Your program, you think you might be able to release that sometime next month, or it might take uh, another two or three months in any time frame? We're, we're only in like touch three or four out of 10. So it's probably early next year by the time we get it to scale. What, what I'm considering is rather than handing you a finished product, maybe just teaching a course on what we just said, like email copywriting. I've, I've studied hundreds of hours of copywriting to get what I can summarize in a few minutes of talking. So the things that like proven results, like here's what we found worked. Here's how you get 53% open rates. And it's always changing, but that's kind of the, what doesn't change. Those things are things I've done consistently over time that yielded a consistent result. Focus on a problem they have or a solution they want. Emotional question for a subject line. One emoji, no more. Okay. And hopefully a relevant emoji. Present the problem or the solution in the first sentence. Keep it short. Always have a PS line with a call, an alternative to the call to action. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, and I didn't know that you are a diver. I'm a diver too. Maybe we can go diving sometime in the future. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, when I lived in Maui, I used to keep like a whole truck bed full of tanks and I shore dove cool. almost daily, either free dove or shore dove. And I really don't get out there. So I think the last dive I did was in the uh, cenotes in Mexico where it was like 80 feet down, a quarter mile in and no exit. I think I'll I think I'll leave that to the nitro nitrox guys from now on. Yeah, yeah. Actually I, I, I was fortunate enough to, to go diving in the Galapagos two months ago. I think and I'm going there this year. We had a we had our mastermind trip planned for Australia and yeah. now Australia is prohibitive. So I think we're actually going to the Galapagos. Should Finally get to see and Josh Foster, you're gonna love this. If you don't know what a teal footed booby is, you need to look because he has exit three the color of your shirt. Unfortunately, the arch is down. I saw that. Uh, yeah, just yeah. a few days ago. Yeah, yeah I saw it. Uh, I, I was lucky. I, I took some pictures of it with me, me in the background. I got lucky. Now it's down. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Michael, thanks for being here. I will I'll work on getting you something that I can hand you and say, this works. Appreciate it. I appreciate Again, it, Chad. Josh Foster, you're on deck. Am I up or I'm up next? You're up now. Okay, awesome. Hey, you had asked earlier about any success. I've been doing probate way before I found all the leads and then found you and you just fine-tuned it 
and it's been awesome. So just closed the deal, been working on since almost the beginning of the year. This is a, it, it was a very uh, touchy situation. It was a mother who had come down with dementia and had to relocate to Texas with her uh, children. And I was dealing with two sisters who had polar opposite personalities and they both had, they were, they both had joint POA. So we got the home sold. So it wasn't probate, but it was pretty much the same. Literally, this was the first time where I literally took the project from start to finish. From We had hurricane damage where I'm at in Lake Charles. We had two hurricane, major hurricanes last year. Had hurricane damage. We had to facilitate a new roof. We had to facilitate repairs. All the above, and I was able to take it front, start, literally from repair all the way to clean out. And it was... I don't think I could have done it had I not gone through probate mastery, just because I already had a lot of those tools in that toolbox. I just didn't know how to work them out. And with that program, man, it just, it was seamless. Everybody left. Uh, we all left hugging. They all left thanking and they're working on the review. So I can't wait to read it, but literally left like being family and totally trusted the whole process. And it was awesome. But I have a question. I need some advice. Before you go there, we'll cover that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. A piece of advice, don't sit around and wait for a written review. When you wait for a review, it's after you hit the record button on your iPhone. It's a powerful yeah. story. They look at you as a trusted advisor. So use that trust to your advantage. While, they while mm -hmm. they're at the emotional peak of this, and they, 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 they really hold you in high regard. You deserve to have that as a video testimonial. You can transcribe it into text and use it wherever you want. Get those yeah. videos Man, because it can be idea. worth literally millions of dollars over your career. Yeah. Don't waste an opportunity to tell the world how damn awesome you are and how much you actually help that family. The awesome. other thing is a question. How many times did you go to the property over that time period? I was at the property no more than five times total. Yes. That's the right answer. Yeah. So a lot of folks getting started, and I'm not accusing anyone here, but when people are first getting into probate, one of their big hesitations when they hear about this methodology is, holy shit, that sounds complicated. You need 14 people. But the reality is, if you're building a good vendor team, they support you. And we would usually, I, I typically would go to the property no more than twice, even if it was one of those where you had to have all this stuff. And yeah, I've talked about this in the course. I always put the, an electronic lockbox on the front door and a combo lockbox on the back door. Even if I had to take their key, drive to Lowe's, get two made and come mm -hmm. back, I would still mm -hmm. insist that we had both ends of the house lockbox because I wasn't coming back out there. I have a team that does this for me. There's no need for me to be here. I know you expect that. Let's adjust that expectation. I'll see you at the closing table. So good for you to be able to facilitate that without losing all that dollar productive activity or, or time. And so many people get wrapped up in that. Who was it that was, I'm, I'm losing the name. In the last couple of months, a guy, shoot, I feel bad. I, I only work with a thousand people a week. How can I forget? Anyway, he was lost in that. He was so, it was so important to him, but he served these families. He was trying to do it all. He was literally mm -hmm. doing the clean out and doing all. And I'm like, man, you're losing money. You're not helping anyone. Like you don't even have a life. And we had to kind of recalibrate him and, and teach him to go find the right vendors to do the work for him. So good on you for that. Two, two of the times I was there was literally a swing by while the, while one of the siblings was there. So I could pick up checks to mail to the vendors. We had a pool. Oh, by the way, we had to fill in a pool because the hurricane totally just destroyed it. We had to fill in a pool. And what was great is over half the vendors that I've, I've used for years, I've never met. If they walk through my office door, I, they don't know them. I can talk to them on the phone. I've never met them. So I have it was, the same uh, thing. it was great. I do have a quick question and I'm dealing with a, a probate situation, walk in actually into my office. I didn't even, we didn't even mail out, walked in this, the son passed away, left, left a home. He has a child of age. And then the dad who lives in Michigan is going, is the independent executor of the estate. The son who, the son that passed away, the decedent has a live-in girlfriend for about 15 years in Louisiana. There's no common law, so there's no possible common law, spousal, whatever. It's not that way here. So 
anyway, we're getting ready. That, my understanding is the executor, that, which is the father, has been paying the mortgage. He wants to have the home listed and put on the market by June the 1st. I went out last week and did a CMA on the property. She let me into the house. She keeps It's very well kept. The house has been extremely well maintained. The yard's been groomed. I've passed by it. For the last three weeks, I've been talking to the dad after the walk-in. I've been walking. It's right by my office. So I've been passing by it just to keep an eye on it. So we're ready. He wants to go live on June the 1st. The problem is, my understanding is the state is going to, she's not entitled to any of it, but they've agreed to give her an amount. He didn't tell me the amount. They've agreed to give her an amount and make her sign something stating she was going to be out of the property by a certain day. Probably, I'd say June 30th, if I had to guess from the, the way our conversations have been going. So I've reached out to her, trying to set up a time where I would like to meet with her before the first, before we go live, mainly because I, like I told the executor of the state, I want to set the expectation of, for showings. And I, we're going to have cooperation. Is this house going retail? Yes, it's going to retail. The house is in fantastic shape. Okay, so you're the lever. It's important yeah. that he not become the bad cop. He has to be the good cop. He, okay. He's done the right thing, like giving her what she's entitled. I don't give a damn what state law says. She's That's entitled, right. and he, he's doing the yeah. right thing. He has to be able to say, before I can release this money, What what I would suggest is that before he releases the money, she has to hand him the keys and it needs to be broom swept and, and, and move like at least deep clean ready. Like it needs to be ready for you to get in yeah. there with cleaners and photographers. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a, a 30 day conflict here. So he wants right. June 1st. She, a reasonable time frame is June 30th. So you need to have a conversation with him and just say, listen, man, I, 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 we're, I'm not going to put this home on the market until she's moved out because I can't get you the high, I can't truly be your fiduciary right. and get you the highest price unless I can do what I do best. And so I need you to put pressure on her to be out this date, like by June 15th, I, if I'm going to have this ready for market by June 30th. So make me the bad cop, throw me under the bus. I don't care. It's important that you don't make yourself the bad cop. Go blame this on me and say, listen, I wanted this on the market, or, or like this this has to be on the market by June 30th, and this and guy is telling me you have to be out by the 15th if that's going to happen. So here's the deal. I'm going to change what I wrote here, and if you bring me the keys on the 15th, you get a cashier's check mm -hmm. that day, and have him throw you under the bus. That way sure. they can maintain, because if he ends up as the bad cop and she digs her heels in, yes, you're not selling yes, that right. house for six months. And the sheriff right. will be the one that, that moves her out. So it's, it's a fragile situation. Be willing to be the bad guy and give him the permission to make you that. So he can, you can be the lever that he pries her out with Perfect. and gets her to do what is probably the healthiest thing for her anyways. That's right. I've got one more quick question in that same, on that same scenario. He had just emailed me Saturday letters, his letters of independent executorship, all that stuff. I've got all that from my file, but he just e emailed me a few items that were to, that are supposed to remain in the home that I guess were personal items that, that they were wanting. It sounds like they've already talked about it. It's, it's not a, not an incredible list is what I'm saying. It's maybe 10 items. He lives in Michigan. This is the only main part I'm mainly asking is what, uh, how do I facilitate inspecting that these items are left? I'm cool with going through, taking pictures, showing him they're there. You recommend, but I also don't want to be, I also don't want to be tied up going back and forth over a bunch of stupid shit for what, for ever either. I won't, I'll go one time, show you they're still in the house. You got, we'll get the keys or have her drop the keys off to the attorney that's handling the estate and let her sign pick up her check and let's move on. Yeah, Zoom on your phone. Oh, yeah. Do a recorded Zoom call. That way you've got it. You, you can send him the recording. If he if there's anything, any question, yeah. you can say, actually, I sent you the recording. The day I was there, that was there. What happened to it after that? Not up to me. Just so you don't, putting yourself in there as, as kind of the, the personal property escrow agent, like just get recorded. So the Zoom okay. video and doc, document what's there, send it to him for his evidence, and then get the hell out of there. Nice. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Josh. Yes, sir. All right. Justin, you still there? Yes, sir. How can we help you, Justin?
uh, call came in on all the leads last week, and it was an interesting one. I wanted to get your quick take. Property is investors willing to make an offer to the estate for $30,000. PR is an heir getting 50% of that, so $15,000. Four additional heirs getting the other 50%, so about under $4,000 each. One of the four, so everybody's in agreement except one of the four. The, one of the four, we're not sure if it's greed. And they also expressed a possible desire to want to want to keep the house. So everything seems logical, except dealing with this illogical, maybe it's logical, but dealing with a person who may or may not be able to take on the responsibility of home. This is protection. easy, man. Okay. Send, send them a damn purchase agreement. I'm not following you. So they get a $4,000, their, 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 their share of it is 4,000, right? Uh, approximately. Sure. Yeah. And your gross sale price is 50,000, right? Th 30. 30000 So send them a purchase agreement with their name on it and a $26,000 purchase price. Okay. We've got four heirs cooperating and just one heir that, that's not. I'm exactly. just trying to get... You're going to have four names on the DocuSign envelope. Everybody's going to be in the number one position. So okay. you're going to hold them accountable in front of their siblings by calling them to the carpet. You want to buy this house? Here's the blue pen. So everybody oh. sees a DocuSign envelope. They see that, that person's name on there as the purchaser. They oh. see the, the personal representative's name on there as the seller and put an end to this. Because if they want to buy it, there's a really simple way. Come up with 26000 bucks in addition to your part of the distribution. You can Got have it. this out. So I would do that if they're being at all malicious. Like if they're doing this just to be... Uh, a thorn in the side of, of other family members. Right. I would hold them accountable in a very subtle, but very fucking embarrassing way. Okay, so you're saying, okay, here's, you know, my offer is thirty. Uh, say I'm the investor. My offer is thirty thousand. If you want, if you want the house, you got to match that offer. You were only going to get four thousand. You come up with the other twenty six thousand, and you buy it out of the the estate. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And then you'll see and if they can or cannot. They may not be able to. And they're then not have buy. to. Yeah. They would have already done it if they were going to do it. Oh, interesting. Okay. They have a beef with somebody else, and they're trying to be a thorn in the side. Okay. But you'll learn that. Once you dig into this story, you'll see. If they really wanted to buy it, they would have expressed that as their primary desire before they explored the option of getting forth to someone who can afford a $30,000 house that probably won't qualify for financing. 4000 bucks isn't going to mean all of Right. Yeah, and it might need repairs, so I don't know what it's worth, but yeah, okay. Those $30,000 houses are pretty hard to finance unless you do it with community banks. Agreed, agreed. Okay, so just forcing them to put up or shut up on the uh, on wanting That's to probably what up. I would try. Yeah. Do you okay, have great. do you have rapport with that person? Have you talked to them? No, it was another person's example, but we were all looking for answers last week. What so. I would do is talk this through with the person you have rapport with and say, hey, listen, it seems to me like, and don't accuse them, but say, it seems like I've seen this before, and it seems like they might just be trying to complicate things, probably because of something that happened in the past. But I have an idea, as long as you're on board with it, I think we can move forward, and then let them know that's what you're going to do. Let them know. And when that DocuSign envelope shows up, have them follow up and say, hey, uh, we, we just sent you a purchase agreement. We wanted to give you basically get, respectfully give you the right of first refusal before we, we sell this to this other investor. You've got and give them a 48 hour ratification timeline and a 30 day closing timeline in, in the purchase agreement. And if they if they're not okay with that, then they can change it. But that's going to hold them like they're going to it's they're probably going to be have like a deer in the headlights. What do you mean? I, right. And so that gives you forty eight hours to flush out this objection and find yeah. out if it's real. Got it. Okay. And you call that a forty eight hour ratification? You Usually. can write it up. Say this if this contract isn't fully negotiated and ratified within forty eight hours. Yeah. It's therefore null and void. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Put it as an expiration date on the contract too. On Okay, thank you. All right, guys. We're Mike, I'll give you one more chance. Are you there, Mike, without a last name? Mike, without a last name and a yellow hand up? All right, I think that's a wrap for this week. Let me make sure in our questions. Kat, is there anything that I have missed that I should answer over here in the chat? Nope, not today. All right. Chad, cool. quick question about the what you just told Justin. So if you are, I don't know if Justin's an agent or not, but if he's dealing with an investor, and he's essentially assigning it. And there is that, that third sib, third, fourth sibling, whatever, who is now saying that they want to purchase the house. 
Would you do that as well based on what I was telling you last week where like a assigning the property? And if so, because I feel like that complicates things and then you got to broker it. If I had a license, I wouldn't be assigning anything. All right. No, with my license. Like I wouldn't I, be, I hear you. be, there would be no brokerage document. No, I hear you. I'm just wondering if, are you essentially just telling them, are you essentially just telling them to get a purchase agreement and then just the siblings who want to sell are so, so, and Justin, you can feel free to chime back in. I assume that either Justin has a license or he has a realtor that he trusts. Either way, he can deliver a purchase agreement today for sale. Gotcha. Okay. That, that's right. I, I just missed that little step. Okay, cool. No, I'm neither. I would, uh, in this scenario, I might be the investor making the $30,000 offer. Gotcha. Uh, all I was trying to get at is how do you overcome the objection of that one heir who's only got you know $4,000 coming to them, and, but yet they're objecting to the whole transaction of selling it to an investor because they're claiming they want to keep the house. So Chad's suggestion of forcing them to buy it out from the other heirs sounds like a, a great way to get them to the table to put their feet. And if you don't have a broker, if you don't have a broker or an agent that can write that contract for them as like their buyer's agent, the other thing you can do is just write your own purchase agreement and give the family a 48 hour first refusal to perform. And they have to produce a ratified purchase and sale agreement within 48 hours or your contract is first position and get them to sign that. And then that person's accountable. And if all, they don't have to close in 48 hours, but if they don't come forward with a ratified purchase agreement and an earnest money deposit, then your contract goes live. Okay. Yeah, same awesome. thing, different tool. Thank you. So that's probably in your situation. That's probably the way I would do it is investor purchase agreement to family get family to sign it, 48 hour clock or first refusal starts. And then if not, kickout clause takes over. Like you kick them out and right. you're, you're the first place contract. Thank you. Thank oh, you. way to hold me accountable, Fed. No, I just, cause, cause I was just trying to figure out like what's, if they don't have a contract, where are they going to get that contract? You know what I mean? Someone who's not yeah. in a field, whether investor, realtor, not realtor. I think if, if probate or anything like this is overwhelming, just the thought of telling someone, hey, write up a purchase agreement, I think they'd have a heart attack right then and there. So that, that's all I was trying to figure out. Guys, I love these calls. Who likes these calls? Show hands. I'm having more fun with these than I have in the last seven years on the other ones. I like the video aspect. I like that you guys are willing to share success, but also fed. I'm pointing at you. Hold yourself accountable in front of the whole damn world. Love the culture here. So thank you guys for all your participation and always having great conversations. This is time spent for me. I hope it is for you. And next week on Tuesday, let's see, I'll be driving. So probably my backdrop next week won't be as pretty as the Greenbrier River. It's probably going to be like a truck stop somewhere in Ohio or somewhere, but I'll try to find us a good spot. So. Until then, you guys have a great week, and uh, we'll talk with you soon. Thank you, Chad.